Now, some things about our advances in knowledge and our advances in the understanding of how the human body work. These are the same sort of advances that are going to take us into the next century in our understanding of, of how things work. Advances in structural knowledge lead to enormous functional knowledge. Without structural understanding, most functional knowledge is just a series of observations and hypotheses. Hypotheses. Right? Both parts that are internal that you can't see and parts that are external. How about your automobile? Let's say that you'd never seen an automobile before. Right? You come up to this automobile and you know, if you just start examining it from here, you go, well, it looks like it could roll, right? Without knowing a whole lot about it, with just the structure you could see externally, you could see, well, there's these round things that looks like it could roll. Those support the whole body. That looks like there's seats inside. I guess people must sit inside. And you can begin to sort of figure out what this thing might do. If you'd never seen one before, you could start hypothesizing you could start guessing what this might do, right? And the more and more parts you could see, the more and more guesses you could make, the closer you could come to what it does. Structure not only determines function, it reveals function. When we don't know what things do, when we don't know how things do what they do, we try to look at structure and make guesses about that. That's basically what the scientific enterprise is, is looking at the structure of things and guessing how it might perform. When I, when I can't really see all of the structure of something, I have to make lots of guesses. And this is what science is about, because there's a lot of things that we can't see that we can't observe. So we have to make guesses. We come upon, we come to theories, what we call scientific theories, when we test things out, we observe and hypothesize, we may not know exactly what it is, but if we can get enough guesses together that we get the same kind of results over and over again, then we can start saying, well, you know what? This always works this way. But structure really illuminates it for us. And we have pressed down into the cellular and molecular knowledge of things today, and that's why we're so good at much. This is why you see so many advances in medical science these days. Now, there are two, there are two times, there are two uh, tools that have come about over the last several centuries that have really made a difference. They've made a difference because they revealed structure that had never been seen before. The moment we had an advance in our ability to see structure that we had never seen before, our understanding of function skyrocketed. Now, the first one was about 300 years ago. About 300 years ago, a tool called a light microscope was invented. People were polishing glass, and they found that if they polished it and they curved the polished surfaces of the glass, light would pass through and would expand and we could see things that were before this time were too small to be seen. And we moved from guessing about the microscopic things, the tiny little things that might be in our world because we couldn't see them, we really didn't know they were there, to actually seeing them. Prior to this, people like Pasteur and others were guessing that there might be some sort of, of small things that couldn't be seen that were causing disease or causing things to rot and decay. But they couldn't see them. With the advent of the light microscope, we could now begin to see these things. Not only that, but one of the things that happened as investigators looked at more and more and more living things. It must be like, you know, a little kid. You give a kid a microscope, and what do they do? Let's look at this. Let's look at that. Let's look, right? They just, you know, you go grab, grab that insect, grab that leaf, grab that blade of grass. Let's put everything under the microscope and see what it looks like. Well, the more and more and more the light microscope was used in that way, 
as we started looking over and over again at living things, what we saw was that all living things appear to be constructed out of what they called cells. Now the word cell is the same root word that we use in terms of a prison or a jail. There's a jail cell. What is a jail cell? It's a little room, isn't it? Right? And if you went back 300 years, the rooms in a house would have been called cells. It's just stuck in that prison concept. It hasn't stuck in terms of our homes. But the word cell was that. And so basically what they were saying is when you look at living things, living things seem to be full of little rooms, little separate spaces. Now if you look over here, you can see these separate little boxes in that tissue, in that living thing. So they began to develop this, what we call cell theory. And today, we, we've looked at enough living things that we know these things to be true, that all living things are either a single cell or many, many, many cells living together in a cooperative relationship. Visible living things are huge societies. Think of like San Bernardino or the community where you live. Right? Really what you have going on there is a very cooperative thing. Uh, People hundreds of years ago kind of had to live on their own, right? You had to be able to sew your own clothes, grow your own food, cook your own meals, make your own shoes. You know, anything that you were going to do, you had to do it for yourself. But as people started living together in the cities, they said, hey, I'll, I'll get really good at doing this. You get really good at doing that, and we'll trade. I'll do this for you. You do this for me. And that's how we're doing it today. We've got people that drive the trucks. Are you thankful for the people that bring the food to the grocery store for you? Right? So you don't have to go down to the boat that brought it over or go out to the farm somewhere. Now, everybody has roles to play. Everybody has a job. And the same thing is true in living things. Cells, the, the cells, the little compartments, the little structures within the living thing are each providing a service. Each and every cell is a living thing. And they're specialized. So what happened here was before the light microscope, we had a lot of ignorance, a lot of guesswork, because we couldn't see the structure. The moment we could see structure, and we started looking at the structure over and over and over again, we began to understand certain things that were never known before. That all living things are constructed out of cells. This is, this is one of the major tenets in all of biology, is that everything about living things is cellular. The cells are the actors on the stage here. Now, as good as this was with the light microscope, there was still a roadblock. The light microscope was good at showing us the cells that make up a living thing, but now the question becomes, how does the cell do what it does? If the cells are the parts of the body, what are the parts of the cells? How do cells work? And the, the parts of the cell were so small that they couldn't be seen easily in the light microscope. And they were, they were all in this big fluid mass. When you look at a cell under a light microscope, it looks like a little drop of clear jelly. And it actually has all these intricate little parts to it, but you can't see them under the light microscope. So it really took a second advance to really propel our knowledge of function one more time so that we could really understand the cell. So what was, what was this second? It happened about, about 50, 60 years ago. We got a brand new tool. What? Yeah, the electron microscope. 
Now, instead of using light to look at things, this microscope uses electrons, which are, it, it are very small. It used electrons to try and image the structure of cells. And two electron microscopes came about, one called a scanning electron microscope that made sort of like three-dimensional pictures of little very small things. Even things we could see with our eyes like an ant, all of its little parts became very, very illuminated. But even more than that, there's a, a second electron microscope called a transmission electron microscope. The transmission electron microscope gave us pictures like this. And so if this was that cell that we were looking at before that just looked like a bunch of jelly of just a bunch of goop in here, now the electron microscope began to give us these images where we could see the very structure of the internal parts of a cell. To get these pictures, what they'd have to do is freeze some cells so that they were solid. Then they could slice through them so that everything kind of stayed, all the jelly sort of stayed in place. And then you slice through it, and then you image that, and we got these kinds of pictures. Amazing, amazing things. Stuff that had never been seen before was all of a sudden there. I can still remember being about 10 years old in, a, in a, um, one of my distant cousins who was you know, friends with my mom, so she was worked in biochemistry. I remember her sending me some scientific American articles that had pictures like this, things that had never been seen before. Bacteria and viruses could even be imaged at that point, which are even smaller than cells. So this electron microscope really was able to show us what was going on now inside. And before it was just guesswork. We could observe a cell. We knew what cells were doing, but we didn't know how they were doing it because we couldn't see their structure. We couldn't see their parts. Now we could see the parts. We can see almost down to the molecular level, and we could begin to link our knowledge of chemistry to our knowledge of living things. And that's really where we are today. We have the other, I guess, the second revolution that was ha happening about 50, 60 years ago was the chemical revolution. Coming out of World War II and, and into um, the 50s and the 60s, there was a lot of money poured into chemical research. And today we have a solid understanding of chemistry and molecules, and we've brought our cellular knowledge right down to where these two have linked up, and now we can pretty much understand it all, or at least have the capacity to understand it all. Right? This is, this is what those cells would look like under the light microscope. Right? And you can see, if you look at a cell like this, you can see sort of that dark blue spot there that was called the nucleus, but all of the rest of the stuff in there was just goopy stuff. Or if you look at these plant cells down here, you can see the walls that separate them, that make them cells. You can see that there's a nucleus there, but you couldn't see the kind of detail that you would see here. Let me get us there. Right, so that cell right there is this cell, but now you can see all of the structure to it. Okay, or this plant cell. If you look what a plant cell look like, looks like there, and then look at this representation here from the electron microscope, now you can see all of the various parts there. So there have been some distinct scientific advancements that have just opened up a world of structure, which has then opened up the world of function to us. Again, let's, let's just summarize a little bit. These cells are the key structures in understanding the structure and function of the human body. 
Uh, here I'm using for the first time the word organelles. Okay, the term organelles, we're going to use that a number of times, are the names for these little tiny parts of the cell. If I asked you, name one of the organs in your human body, you'd name one of its parts, right? Like a heart or a lung or a stomach or a liver or something. You'd name one of your parts. The word organelle is the same word, only it means little organs. The little diminutive L here in French means little. So an organelle is a little organ. So we're talking about the little organs within the cell structure. 